And our next witness wishes to be known as Dave, does he? That's right, sir. Please state your full name. Dave Anthony Gort. And take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Dave, you have haemophilia A, classified as severe. Yes, that's right. And that was diagnosed when you were a baby. That's right. And you would receive during your early childhood cryoprecipitate, <coughs> administered by the GP. Yes. Um, you also then started to receive factor eight. But that was reserved for very severe bleeds in your case. Why was that? Because I developed antibodies to uh, the treatment factor eight. Um, so I developed inhibitors. So I would always have to be admitted into hospital. Um, so the first treatment would work to some degree uh, before my immune system would recognise that the clotting factor was not its own and suddenly put up the barriers to that treatment. So it was always administered in the hospital. And the care that you received at the time was Royal Manchester Children's Hospital in Pendlebury. That's right. And for the reasons you've explained, when you received Factor Eight, you received it there. Yes. And you think it was around 1983 there that you first received Factor Eight? Yes. My mum kept a diary and there's a note of me having a knee bleed in 1983 uh, where I was administered Factor Eight. That's the kind of earliest record we could find. And you'd have been about six years old at the time, is that right? Yes. Now, as far as you're aware, were your parents given any information or warnings or advice about any risks to you of infection from receiving the Factor products? No, they weren't. They weren't? No. Um, there's one letter that I'm going to ask to be put up on screen, and it should come up on the screen in front of you, Dave. It's 124003. And we can see it's a letter, 24th of August 1985, addressed to your parents from the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. And it says this, we've been sending blood samples away from the children with haemophilia and similar disease to see if they are at risk of AIDS. None of our patients has developed AIDS or has shown any signs of doing so, but all of us, both parents and staff, are anxious about the problem. The results are now coming through. The blood tests on your child, and then we have inserted David, show he is negative for HTLV3, i.e. the AIDS virus. This is good news. We hope to be able to repeat the test every year or so to see if there is any change. Now, do you um, know whether your parents were aware before receiving this that you were being tested for HIV? No, as far as I'm aware, they, they weren't told that I was being tested for HIV. Um, now, that was 1985 and you were given, or your parents were given the news that you were negative in terms of HIV. Um, your care then transferred in 1992 to the Royal Hallamshire Hospital. Yes, that's right. And you received a letter in June 1992 asking that you come in for a, an appointment. Yes, yes, to register with the Haemophilia Centre there in Sheffield. And I think you said in your statement that the letter specifically referred to coming in for testing for uh, HIV or hepatitis C, but you've now found the letter, and in fact it simply invites you in for an appointment. That's right. Um, but when you attended that appointment, was, were tests undertaken in relation to hepatitis? Yes. When I registered at the Haemophilia Centre in Sheffield, they just said that all new patients, they routinely tested for hepatitis C and HIV. Uh, and... Um, what can you recall about being told of the results of those tests? I seem to remember it was a couple of weeks later and the test came back and I was called in, I think with my parents at, uh, at present, to say that um, they'd found that I was uh, hep C positive. Um, and that was the first I'd ever been told of that. And there'd never been any mention at Royal Manchester Children's Hospital that, you know, in fact, 
I think there is a letter somewhere in my records from Royal Manchester Children's Hospital denying that my parents actually wrote to them to ask because I think it was referred to as non A, non, non, a, non B or something before they called it hepatitis C. My parents had obviously heard something, I think, in the, in the press. I'd written to Dr Evans at Royal Manchester Children's Hospital and there was a flat denial that, that you know, that I'd received that, so... So you were told in around the middle of 1992 at the Royal Hallamshire that you'd contracted hepatitis C. Um, were you given information about the condition? Um, the sort of key message to me, I think, was that um, not to pass it on to anyone else. I think that, that was one of the main things, is kind of to be careful of sexual contact, that I wasn't to sort of pass it on. Uh, from memory, they gave me a booklet about sort of healthy eating and... Uh, foods to avoid. Um, I've tried to find that, but unfortunately, I've not been able to locate it. Uh, and um, you said in your statement you were told that you shouldn't be too worried, but you were also told that there'd be regular scans to check for uh, liver lesions and liver cancer. That's right. So they did say, um, you know, not to be too concerned that the treatments that were available at the time they thought were ineffective for hepatitis C and the side effects were worse than kind of the outcomes, I suppose, um, that they would monitor it through um, quarterly blood tests. And I had, um, I think it was yearly ultrasounds. And you said in your statement also, you, you think you were provided with the information that the doctors had at the time. Yeah. Um, the one message that you um, um, say wasn't spelt out to you was advice about not drinking alcohol. Yeah, I don't think that was communicated strongly enough, really, considering my age and the fact, you know, I would be drinking fairly soon. I don't think they spelt out poss the possible consequences, really, of that strongly enough. Now, you don't know precisely when you were infected with hepatitis C, but you've seen something in a re more recent letter, which we'll look at. It's 1244004. Uh, and if we just look at the first part of that letter under the heading Diagnosis, we've got some numbered paragraphs, and two says, Chronic hepatitis C genotype 4, infected before 1985. And that's the first time you've been given any kind of date range? Yes, that's the first time I've ever seen that in writing, that I was infected with hepatitis C. Can I just ask you about what information you received about the risk of VCJD? Uh, you've said in your statement that you learnt about that, first of all, from communications from the Haemophilia Society. And we'll just look briefly at that. It's 1244005, please, Paul. And we can see that you received uh, this communication from the Haemophilia Society dated September 2004, which uh, talks about you should have received notification from your Haemophilia Centre about steps some people will need to take to prevent any possible transmission of VCJD to other patients. Yes. Uh, and then that, uh, I think, triggered uh, you contacting your haemophilia centre and having a conversation with the doctors there. Yes, during a review clinic, you know, I was obviously, obviously concerned about the possibility of developing VCJD, uh, or contracting VCJD, um, and they sort of gave me some reassurance about that. But... Then I had subsequent letters that sort of said uh, I hadn't received implicated batches, but then I think the Department of Health changed their mind and decided that for public health purposes, all haemophiliacs were considered to be at risk for public health. And we can just look at a couple more documents in, in the same, um, with the same reference number, please, Paul, but the seventh page. So we can see here in late 2004, this is a letter from Sheffield Teaching Hospitals to you, and it refers to the recent information we've sent you regarding VCJD and our subsequent conversation. I'm writing to confirm we've checked our records. These show you have received UK NHS clotting factor concentrate at Manchester Children's Hospital, but not at the Royal Hallamshire. In view of this, you are therefore at risk for public health purposes. And then if we go to the second paragraph of the letter, please, Paul. As discussed, I can confirm that you have not received any of the implicated batches of clotting factor that have been prepared 
from plasma of donors who subsequently developed variant CJD. Um, and then you produced a, a letter you received some five years later. That's at 1244002, please, Paul. Next page. So this is a letter, February 2009, and it's writing to our, all our patients who've received clotting factors made from UK plasma during 1980 to 2001 to tell them about a person with haemophilia who's been found to have evidence of the infection that causes VCJD in his spleen at post-mortem. All haemophilia centres are contacting their patients throughout the UK to give them this information. And what you've said in your statement is that although you've been told that you hadn't received implicated batches in 2004, you're, you still worry about the possible implications of yeah. these risks. Absolutely. And do you have a clear understanding from the communications you've received about the extent of any risk to you? Not really, no. I think it's, it's mixed and that is, is sort of evidence to me sort of through the treatment I've had since then. So uh, in 2014, I was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver and um, I was sent for test uh, and endoscopy uh, to check for esophageal varices um, because of the severe nature of my bleeding disorder I had to take uh, an injection of my clotting factor uh, before and that the clotting factor only has a half-life of two hours um, it was a recombinant product that, that only lasts for two hours in the system and the uh, I think it's radiographers they spent an hour and a half of that time deciding what they would do with the scopes afterwards because on my records, it said that I was at risk of BCJD. And so I got quite panicky in that last half an hour that my clotting, knew my clotting factor was running out, but they were going to push this scope down my throat and possibly cause bleeding, you know, during that procedure. Now, what physical impact has the hepatitis C had on you in, in those first few years? Uh, I don't think I realised it at the time, but... Um, because you, I suppose I didn't know what life was like without hepatitis C, so I had nothing really to compare to, but I just felt extremely tired, and I just thought everybody felt like that, you know. Um, I can remember driving home from a job and, and almost falling asleep at the wheel and, and thinking, this is dangerous, and kind of, you know, maybe I'm working too hard, but I was thinking, no, everybody works the same hour as I do. Um, so I was inexplicably tired and I'd, sometimes I'd be okay but but I'd hit a wall of tiredness and just couldn't explain that and, and you said you tried to remain positive but when you were having the blood tests or scans you would worry about the results and their consequences yeah absolutely I in, think my, my sort of coping strategy was uh, I'd say it but was to stick my head in the sand and hope that everything would be okay and um you know, that that was just my way of coping, really. In 2011, you embarked upon a course of treatment with the hepatitis C, interferon and ribavirin. Yes. What was that like? Horrendous. Absolutely the worst thing in my life, I think. Um, I wonder to some degree whether that brought on some of the cirrhosis. It's hard to say, or just if hepatitis C progressed anyway. Um... I was working full time then for the civil service at the time, and I, I, uh, I had no social life at all. I was it was just work. Uh, work were very good with me. I, they I had to go to hospital every Friday in Sheffield because the treatment was so severe. Um, it was knocking my platelet count, and uh, so I'd have to have blood test every week to check. Uh, my level and then they would adjust the dose of the interferon and ribavirin but my um, sort of viral load was decreasing so you know the the advice was to carry on and I did this for a year but it the treatment made me uh, I had dry skin um, very itchy I couldn't sleep I'd get very hot um, I was incredibly moody um, the hospital did say that that was a known sort of side effect of the treatment, and they offered me antidepressants, which at first I declined. But after, I think, only a week, I said, OK, yes, I'll have the antidepressants, please. 
Um, so throughout the course of treatment, I was on antidepressants as well because I'd just have complete mood swings. I'd be low, low and depressed or high as a kite and kind of, um, but just so fatigued all the way. That was probably worse than the hepatitis C itself, really. Um, yeah, I was very irritable with people around me. I'd get very angry. Um, and I think that has caused me some sort of brain fog. I, I lose my thread, I lose my track, and I was very sharp. I feel like mentally that has affected me. Um, and you've also described in your statement that it, in, during the course of the treatment, you suffered from memory loss. Yeah. You found it difficult to concentrate, and, and you would read stuff at work and not be able to take any of it in. I think I just... I've, just read a sentence and I've no idea what it says in that sentence and have to start again and you know I work in communications and so you know I'd be proofreading documents and you know it was so frustrating that I couldn't keep my concentration and you ended up accepting voluntary redundancy because of it yes what was the outcome of that treatment did it clear the virus so uh, by month 12 I had cleared hepatitis C and there was no detectable virus and then in month 13 it came back um because obviously i had sort of gone six weeks without um treatment and so the virus just came back how did that make you feel that news i was completely gutted really because of all i'd been through you know and, and i would have done anything to sort of get rid of the virus I, I really would um to have been through what i've been through it just seemed you know futile really You've mentioned that in 2014 you discovered that you developed cirrhosis of the liver um, and an enlarged spleen. Yes. Uh, and you were becoming prone to infections. And so you had a fibre scan. And what did that show? Um, so the hospital obviously sort of said to me that they'd monitor with uh, regular blood tests. And they'd, said, they'd always said to me from 1992 that my liver function test was normal within a range for somebody who had hepatitis C. Obviously, because of the bleeding disorder of haemophilia, I couldn't have a liver biopsy because it would cause bleeding and obviously you know, risk uh, of dying. So um, a new test became available called Fibroscan, which is sort of flicks the body in the side and measures the elasticity of the liver. And the scan came back with a really high score of 21.4, showing that I'd got cirrhosis. The consultant at the Hallamshire said to me that, you know, he was really surprised at that it didn't correlate really with my blood results, and it did show that I'd got cirrhosis of the liver. Um, and they then referred me to a hepatologist uh, in the infectious diseases team. And... Um, I was very worried about the prospect of developing cancer of the liver. I discussed that with the hepatologist, and he just didn't seem to have any empathy with haemophilia, and he just said, well, if you get a bit of cancer, we'll just cut it out. So I said to the haemophilia centre, I'll, I'll cut him out, and I won't be seeing him again, thank you. So. <laughs> you were desperate to rid yourself of the hepatitis C by this stage. Yeah. Um, and... There was a particular drug, Harvoni, that you wanted to take. That's right. But you, you couldn't get that drug. Why was that? Because uh, the, the strain of hepatitis C I had contracted was genotype 4, which is an Egyptian strain of the virus. Um, it seemed that the drug companies were not really investing in that because not many people contracted that strain of the virus. Um, my partner, Lee, he... He had, um, I didn't realise this at the time, but he'd, um, sorry. It's all right, Dave. Would you like me to read that bit of your statement for you? Please. So your partner, Lee, now your husband, became very concerned and he was obsessively trying to find some kind of trial that you could get on because you and he both feared that because of the fibroscan result, you'd develop cancer. Yeah. And he would stay up at night researching hepatitis C, researching possible trials and possible treatments for you. That's right. He'd been going into work and, and breaking down, and he, he didn't tell me any of that. He was just desperate to 
to find something as you would be for the person that you love. You, um, you went to see a doctor in London, Bart, Professor Graham Foster, in February 2015, to discuss the possibility of, of a course of treatment at Harvoni. At Harvoni. What happened? So at that time he said um, that NHS England sort of um, were discussing, you know, the availability of Harvoni and whether they would fund the treatment um, and to come back and see him in a couple of months' time. And um, we went back in the April and he said, I'm really sorry to say this, but, I, you know, I, I thought NHS England would have got their act together by now. And he basically suggested that if we had the means to pay for it, to do it. Um, he more or less said that. Um, and I'd been given an ex gratia payment of £50,000 after the um, diagnosis of cirrhosis of the liver, and um, we used £45,000 of that to fund a 12-week course of Harvoni. And... Um, after that 12-week course, I've, touch wood, I've been clear of the virus ever since. Um, at the time, uh, NICE was saying that for somebody with genotype 4, rather than taking 12 weeks to clear the virus, it would take 24 weeks, and therefore it would be, you know, it would cost nearly £100,000, and so it wasn't, therefore, clinically effective for me. It, what I found really perverse was that they were funding treatment for people whose liver had already it's already decompensated, so, you know, um, but they just kind of written me off, really, in the, the process. And just taking you back to the discussions you had with Professor Foster, you, he told you your liver was currently holding up, but without treatment, there was a possibility it, it might degenerate to a stage where you'd need a liver transplant. Yes. You have wanted to make it clear you're not critical of Professor Foster at all. No, not at all. Your criticism is reserved for the for the lack of funding. Yeah. Which meant that you used the money that the Skipton Fund had given you because of you being infected. Oh, you know, I would have, like you said before, I would have done anything to clear myself of, of the virus. Um, I'd, I'd kept, always kept very private about having um, contracted hepatitis C, but... I really felt at that point I was fighting for my life. So you, you spent the, the £45,000 from the Skipton Fund on the 12 weeks of treatment? Yes. Were there any side effects that, during the course of that treatment? It, to begin with, it made me a little bit drowsy. Um, so I just learned to sort of take it just before bedtime. I kind of got a better night's sleep. But compared to interferon and ribofirin, it was a walk in the park. And the, the treatment was successful in clearing the virus? Yes. You've had a fibre scan the following year, um, and what did that show? That showed that um, the a score of eleven point four, I think it was, that it, you know my liver had become much more elastic again, and kind of showed signs of improvement. Uh, so, and you put it this way in your statement: your liver was still cirrhotic, but there'd been a dramatic improvement. Yeah. Since then, you've continued to have regular liver function tests? Yes, yeah, and I still have the... Uh, Professor Foster, uh, when he kind of discharged me from his care, said to, to have uh, quarterly ultrasound scans just to check for any lesions or cancer of the liver. Now, one of the observations you've made in your witness statement is that you think it should be a matter of priority for the NHS that treatment is funded for those who were infected through the NHS. Absolutely, yeah. Um, can I just ask you about a couple of, of trials you've been involved with? Um, first of all, if we go back to document 1244004, please, Paul. We looked at this letter earlier, and if we go to the second page... In the penultimate paragraph, it says there are a number of trials being undertaken in individuals with severe haemophilia and inhibitors, um, and that you might well be eligible for one of those. Was that a trial you participated in? Yes, so I um, took part in the trial of femisuzumab. Um, it's a um, recombinant product that, rather than it being an intravenous injection, it's an injection into my stomach that I take once a week that gives me a low level of background clotting factor. So that's a treatment you participated in a trial that relates to your haemophilia. Yes. 
Um, and then you participated in, an, in another trial. Um, you, you were, you've said in your statement you've been told that you were exposed to HIV but didn't contract it. Is that right? That, that I think, is the implication of the trial, yes, that um, for people with inhibitors who... Um, had been, it seems, have been exposed to HIV but not gone on to contract it. And if we just have up on screen 124006, we've got a collection of documents that relate to, to this trial. If we just go to page three, please, Paul. It should be a letter the 20th of November 2009. Thank you. So this is an invitation you received, Dave, from Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Um, enclosing information about a research study which might be of interest to you. It's headed genetic basis of resistance to HIV and haemophilia A. Do you know how it was you were identified as a possible candidate for this? No, I, I don't know how I've been identified other than, you know, somebody somewhere thought that I had been exposed to HIV through contaminated blood products. And, and if we go back to the first couple of pages of this um, set of documents, please, Paul. We can see that in relation to this trial, you were um, asked to uh, confirm your understanding about the information you were given. You were given a detailed patient information leaflet that you've given to us. Yes. And the ramifications and, and implications of the, the trial were explained to you yeah. and recorded in writing. Yeah. Can, can I ask you then, um, Dave, about... The, the stigma generally that you have uh, felt or experienced in relation to the hepatitis C infection. You've, you've described what happened with the treatment in 2014. Um, have you kept your infection private generally or have you shared the information with others? Um, I did. So obviously when we learned that I'd been infected with hepatitis C in 1992. I kept it completely private, even sort of from best friends and so on. I just really felt the stigma. You know, I'd seen how people with HIV were treated. And, I mean, um, even during my sort of working career, I worked for the Disability Rights Commission and I worked for the Equality and Human Rights Commission and I still didn't feel a work that I could tell people. Um, it was more that the people that... I worked with I thought might treat me differently if they knew that so for example when I was undergoing the treatment I um, you know I didn't make it clear what exactly I was going for they just knew it was related to my haemophilia and I, I left it at that and you've said in your statement that you've had horrible experiences when treated by uh, medical professionals um, You'd have nurses always putting on gloves and being particularly cautious around you. And then there was a, an incident when a doctor stuck himself with a needle. What happened? Uh, I think it was a female doctor. George, um, it was a junior doctor, and I was in hospital with a, an active bleed. And I think she'd been taking some blood from me or giving me clotting factor, one, one or the other. And she didn't have gloves on, I don't think. And uh, she stuck herself with the needle. Uh, the butterfly needle as she was taking it out and um, I didn't really think any more of it went to sleep and I was woken during the night actually taken out of bed taken to a side room and asked about what sexual partners I'd had was there a possibility I had HIV they knew I had hepatitis C and how I had contracted that but had I, you know, they asked about sexual partners and so on. It was just humiliating. Um, yeah. And you've also described how um, whenever you've had blood tests, you see a label that on, on your file that says category C risk. Yeah. Um, in terms of friends and family who you have shared this with, your, your husband, your, your close family, <coughs> what's the impact been on them? Um... I mean, I, I felt guilty from keeping a secret for them for so long, and I only went public about it when, for me, it became life-threatening. So when I got the diagnosis of cirrhosis, I thought, I've nothing to lose, really. You know, I, I need to be open and honest about it. Um, I feel guilty because I know a lot of people have campaigned on the issue. Um, in terms of impact on others, I mean, my, my parents, you know, 
having haemophilia is difficult enough, but thinking that I then got an infection on top of that, um, I think it's a burden of guilt for my parents. Um, you know, I've already spoken about my partner and kind of it's only come out after the fact that he was he was getting no sleep really. He was staying up researching every clinical trial and so on. And he you know, has a really professional job and it must have impacted on him and for him as a um going into his workplace and kind of breaking down I feel guilty about that as well. There's a lot of guilt, really, for me. Um, I just think it's really difficult all around. But uh, people have been very sort of understanding, really, and friends and family, because I've got fantastic friends and family. But have you ever been offered any counselling or psychological support? No. Do you think it would have been helpful? Yeah, I think it would. I mean, the whole thing has been so traumatic that, yeah, I think it would help. Have there been uh, impacts in terms of your ability to obtain insurance? Yes. So trying to get travel insurance or life insurance is, you know, well, it's, it's sort of impossible to get life insurance. But travel insurance is just prohibitively expensive, you know, because I thought once I cleared the virus, that would make a difference. But the series of questions that underwriters seem to ask, uh, you know, first of all, you say you've got haemophilia, then um, I think it asks about any joint replacements and the, there's a path and, and it asks about, uh, you know, have you ever kind of contracted hepatitis C? So, of course, you must answer honestly. And yes, I have. Have you cleared the virus? Yes. Have you had esophageal viruses? No. Um, and some, some insurers just decline you completely. You know, you only get so far and, and that's it. It's declined, so... In terms of other financial impacts, you took voluntary redundancy during that first course of treatment for the reasons you've described. Did, did your infection or the treatment and the, the symptoms you experienced impact upon the development of your career? Yeah, I think I would have gone on to progress my career within probably the civil service. And, you know, somebody who was one of my trainees uh, is now an assistant director of communications and policy at a local authority. I think, you know, hopefully I would have achieve that level but I was just kind of so tired and um you know just I, I at one point I was really sort of sharp and I had to be I worked in public relations I was dealing with journalists I had to be ready for questions and kind of um but yeah I just kind of lose my thread and it um the, the concentration aspect of like I say just proofreading and reading the same paragraph over and over until I've actually taken it in I'm sure is an impact of either hepatitis C or the interferon treatment. And, and if you've told us obviously how you, in, in, again in terms of financial impact, you spent the money from the Skipton uh, fund on funding the treatment that you couldn't get funded by the NHS. Um, in terms of uh, um, applications to the Caxton fund, you've said in your statement that uh, it, that had implications in terms of life decisions you were making because they would take into account partner's income. Yes, so um, we sort of delayed moving in together and I think because my partner's got a decent career and so on, I, I think it's unfair that he's kind of expected to sort of pick up the bill, you know, as the, the, when they looked at total household income, you know, why should he have to foot you know, that bill really? So those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything you'd like to add? Just going back to the point about treatment, I think if ever there was a cure for HIV, just, just with hep hepatitis C, I do think that those of us who contracted contaminated blood through contaminated blood products should be put to the front of the queue. And I wouldn't want anybody to go through what I've gone through in terms of... Um, you know, having to fight to get the treatment. I just think that's disgusting. So, Dave, I'm just going to ask Mr Snowden, who represents you, if there are any further questions he would like to have posed. No, there aren't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have uh, no further questions. Just let me thank you very much for coming, and, and coming at such short notice uh, to give the evidence which you have to us. So thank you, thank Dave. You.
Well, we'll take a, a break now until two o'clock. So two o'clock for our third and I think final witness of the of the day. Yes, sir.